Hello, I'm Mark Constantine from Lush. I'm here to talk about my greatest inspiration, brought to you by Real Business and Orange. Behind the ever-expanding chain of Lush Cosmetics stores is husband and wife team, Mark and Mo Constantine. The pair opened their first shop in Covent Garden in 1995. Today, they have 89 stores dotted across the country and over 600 worldwide. The look of a Lush shop was partly inspired by the London cheese shop Neil's Yard. Soap is sold in wedges, priced by weight and wrapped in greaseproof paper. Bath bombs are piled up like fruit and shower soap looks like slices of birthday cake. Mark works as part of the product development team, creating hair, skincare and body treatments. He's also helped to turn Lush from a cosmetics retailer into an ethical brand. In April 2007, for example, he introduced the Charity Pot Project, a hand and body lotion where all the proceeds go towards animal welfare and environmental conservation groups. Mark told us about his plans for Lush. Mark, thank you for joining us today and speaking to us about your greatest inspiration. Now, you set up your first business when you were 22. Talk to us about that. I, I think I was pretty unemployable, to be honest. I only had a, a sort of, well, I only had one, one, two jobs ever before I was 23. Um, and then I basically wanted to sell, make and sell natural cosmetics. Um, so I sort of set up in my, in a, I had a little tiny house and I had a little tiny bedroom. And I cleared the bedroom out and knocked the chimney breast out and all the rest and put a little sink in and made products in there. And then sold them to anyone that, that wanted to buy them. Uh, actually it was quite difficult, not everybody thought they were good. Um, I mean that's a very young age to start up your first business. Yes. Where did you get that entrepreneurial spirit from? I think it's a psychological problem isn't it, entrepreneurism, that's my real view. I think um, my dad left my mum when I was two. I wonder if I'm still trying to impress someone I've never met. I, I think it's a psychological problem. I don't think it's a spirit. Um, being driven, you know, it's sometimes quite difficult, I think. You and your wife, Mo, set up Lush in 1995. Yeah. Um, where did the inspiration come from? Well, there were a group from? of us. There were seven of us in all uh, founded Lush, which is, which is quite important because if you want a fairly broad business, you don't get many cosmetic companies setting up very tiny. You need quite a lot of people to help deal with legislative aspects and manufacture and retail and so on. So there were seven of us. Mo and I were the main shareholders. Um, we, we got the inspiration because we were broke and uh, the previous business had gone bust, um, we had three mortgages, three children, uh, no money, so make a living primarily. Who did you turn to for advice or is there a particular tip that's really helped you? Um, well, uh, various people. I've, I've, obviously, you, you're constantly reading business books, constantly talking to people, and I would recommend that. Um, I, I remember meeting the previous MD of Woolworths at a dinner, and he proudly told me he was he didn't read any business books. And, and since then, of course, Woolworths has gone. And I, I've got that very clearly in my mind. But um, advice from all sorts of people. I remember one particular investor telling me to dig where there were potatoes. Um, and we've used that an awful lot. But you, you know, consistently find what you're successful at, what works well, and then push that. Don't try to push things that aren't working. Just let them fall away. Mm -hmm. The cosmetics industry is fiercely competitive. So what have you done to give Lush the edge? Well, I think we've controlled everything. We, we, we invent our own product. I'm, I'm a perfumer and I, I invent product. So do my, my co-founders. Um, we manufacture our own product and we have our own shops and we retail our own product. Um, so we're quite controlling in that sense. And I think that, uh, I find that very easy. You can set your own tone, your own culture. Um, you don't have to constantly interface with other people. It's, it's much, much harder if you're trying to sell to someone and they don't pay you and there's 101 issues like that. Looking back over the years, if there was one moment when you thought, this isn't going to work, when was that? <laughs> when the receivers came in. That's when I knew it wasn't going to work. <laughs> um, so yeah, after we'd had the original business for 17 years and built it up quite a bit, um, we actually had a mail order business, which was a bit like an early dot com. So where we, th we had some money, we'd sold the rights to a set of products and we invested them in, in this mail order business. We kept striving to get to a profit, but we never did. Um, and then we lost everything, I mean like everything. And, uh, and that, that was pretty much, I felt, you feel a lot of shame there. There's a lot of difficulties with that. Um, I have 200 staff, you feel you've let them down. And, um, so yeah, so that was pretty much the, uh, 
the worst moment, I think. Mm. And given all those lessons that you've learned along the way, is there anything that you're doing to try and inspire the next generation of entrepreneurs? We have tried to offer some leadership for, for other ethical um, companies because, you know, I think that it's quite tricky if you want to set up a company where ethics are a big part of it, um, then you need some examples. And because the examples keep getting bought by large of um, what one might consider unethical competitors, um, that, that's quite tricky. So we have tried to set something of an example there, especially in the last few years. Mm. I mean, you talk about ethics a lot. How are you yeah. trying to turn Lush into an ethical brand? Well, it's not so much trying. It, basically, we had a series of ethics, which, which we can either keep quiet or we can talk about. It. So up to about three years ago, we just kept quiet about it. Um, we were doing things, but we didn't mention it. Now we talk about it all the time. Um, so, you know, whether it's supporting climate change groups or um, or, uh, or groups for human rights or, you know, those sort of things. So we're wishy-washy lefty liberals and we, we like to support those things. I mean, the way we look at it, we like to look after those people that are trying to look after someone else. So, um, you know, uh, when the guys are busy on the Houses of Parliament dropping banners down we like to try to look after them when they're in trouble mm. um, and so on so those people we'd like to try to look after them um, you know fund them fund their things and it takes very little money actually surprisingly but um, but a lot of support mm. so that's what we do you now have 89 stores in this country and over 600 stores worldwide how have you funded that expansion we originally had an investor two investors um, and they put in a relatively modest sum. And we arranged at that time what it would be worth on their exit. Um, we didn't allow that to be any sort of sum. And that's quite important because uh, obviously if you take investment in and then those investors at some stage want to get out and our investors wanted to get out when the tax changed from 10% to 17, um, you know, that they would receive, they would take on their, their monies. You've got to, um, you've got to think forward. Otherwise, you end up with a situation that many of the ethical companies do where they have to sell out to a large conglomerate, quite often someone who, whose ethics they have been critical of because um, the sum of money that the initial investors want is so high they can't raise that themselves. Mm. So, um, so we had that investment and then we recently bought that out. Um, we tend to grow purely through our own investment. So we generate the money from our profits and invest it in our growth. Mm. What else are you doing to promote your business? I hear you've been working with Sir Alan Sugar recently. Yes. Um, well, yes, they, the apprentice came down and, uh, and used our factory for their apprentices. And, uh, so that was quite good fun. I and mean, we do lots of things like that. I mean, that tends to be what we do. We don't advertise. We can't really afford to advertise. So we don't advertise. Um, but we do work extremely hard with um, anyone that wants a bit of fun, anyone that wants to experiment. So we're, you know, we're really happy to open up our doors and we close the factory for the day for them. Um, we organise that they could go out uh, on a boat and pick seaweed. We organise that they could go to the honey farm, take the bees off and all that sort of stuff, which is great, very inspiring for us. I mean, um, since then we've done the same thing with our own staff. And, and they've come up with all sorts of products sort of by playing the apprentice game inside the business. So, you know, you can get a lot of inspiration and a lot of fun out of working like that. Um, so, yeah, so we do all sorts of things like that. And how has the recession hit your business? Um, it's tricky, isn't it? Because you never really know how the recession has hit your business. Um, all you know is that everybody will use it as an excuse for falling sales or dropping profits. So I think... I would prefer to say I don't believe it has. I think quite a lot of the problems we have um, maybe have been magnified by the recession. But uh, I don't believe, we're not like one of those businesses, you know, you hear so many stories of someone got up on Friday um, and, and there was no business and there hasn't been for three months. Uh, we didn't have that at all. We've had slight declines, but which we then push against. So all in all, I think, I think the recession has made it a lot easier to manage the business because people are more realistic mm. and they're working harder um, and they're behaving themselves a bit more. So what's next on the horizon for Lush? Where, where do you hope to be in five years' time? Well, we're opening some spas. Um, we're just opening some spas. We just opened Kings Road um, and then we're, we're opening Kingston, Paul, um, and then Leeds, Glasgow, probably Cardiff, then maybe New York and Tokyo. Um, and we've come up with a completely new concept of treatments. 
called Synesthesia, um, which is quite mind-boggling and is getting great reviews. So that's our main focus at the moment. We're going to have a bit of fun with that. Well, good luck with your spas and thank you very much for talking to Real Business today. Thank you for asking me.